could listen to this music all day long. It is a collaboration uh, between and among musicians from Mali and Cuba. And in fact, this uh, tune that we're listening to is titled Afro-Cubism, featuring Eliades Ochoa and Grupo Patria. Uh, they're a very, very famous group from Cuba, as well as musicians Tumani Diabate and Vasco Cuyate of uh, Mali. It's a great world music album. If you're into world music, this is a, an album you ought to get. It was released in 2010 and won many, many accolades. It's all just basic acoustic music, but just beautiful to listen to. This is Lead Stories. I'm Utrice Lead. And we're going back to this idea of the Twilight Zone that we started discussing a couple of days ago, but with a different twist. In the surreal Twilight Zone of a Donald Trump presidency and administration that we've been living in for the past two years, we can see how pervasive and acute institutional dysfunction has added to our burdens. Now, this is not new. It is not unique to Donald Trump that institutional dysfunction uh, is, is uh, making itself known for the first time. But there are some, there are some very unique things about uh, institutional dysfunction in his time and in our time. So we're asking the question today, have we, you and I, have we abdicated our roles and responsibilities as partners in creating and maintaining a democratic society? Have we decided to opt out of the whole process and stand by and watch what happens and see how it all turns out? Have we decided that, look, this is just too much for us to handle? We're no good at handling this kind of thing, so we will, we will stand on the side. And we will see who remains standing in another two years. But in the meantime, we're just observing. We're not involved, as it were. Although we have many opinions about what is going wrong, but we're not involved. We see no reason to get all excited about jumping into the fray and doing something about anything. For the most part, we are okay. We gripe, we complain, we point fingers, but we are really not ready and we're not interested even in doing, actively doing something that would help the situation become less onerous, less unfair, less un uh, unjust. We're just waiting until we see how they duke it out. I got the feeling that that's what's happening. Of course, we have lots and lots of opinions. But the bottom line is we're not directly involved. We are observing the battle from the hills. And when it's almost over, we will descend with great authority and shoot the severely wounded. That would be our contribution. 
am I being a little bit harsh here? I don't know. You'll tell me. But from what we have experienced in just two years, the enormity of it all oh, and the, the severity of it. And yet, the vast majority of this country, especially those areas and those people who one would think would be ready, ready to react, ready to respond, ready to take charge and say, no, this is not the country that is supposed to be. This is not the way we are supposed to be living. These are not the experiences we are supposed to be having in a so-called, not just a regular democratic society, but the, the democratic society of the world. And yet we look around, we look all around us, and we see people who are experiencing 10 times the misery 10 times the injustice and quality of life that has deteriorated in their lifetime and continues to do so. And they are fighting. They refuse to accept that this is their lot in life and that they can't do anything about it. All they could do is to accept it and say, well, if God had intended us to live a better life, then we would be living a better life. But we have to accept certain things in life. You know, and it, as the saying goes in the pledge, that many people make you know, to accept the things you can't change. Is that what we're experiencing? Is there no way that as a people we can't express and mobilize behind that expression that we cannot and will not tolerate this way, this kind of life. We don't deserve it. We're not supposed to be experience this, experiencing this at this time of the, his, the, the nation's history and even of our own. So I want you to chime in on this one, lest... I might be misreading things. You know, I, it's possible I'm totally misreading things. But I'm not seeing the real deal here. And maybe I'm unfairly pointing the finger of blame at the people who least deserve it. They're doing the best they can. And, you know, everything else is responsible. We have poor leadership. We have crooks in office. We have uh, people who don't understand how government works. We have people who are rigging, uh, rigging everything in their favor. But, you know, that's not us. The important thing is to be clear that that's them. That's what they're doing. We are not doing that. And that should be of great comfort, that we are not doing this. We are not living that way. And therefore, we just have to be patient. Okay. 
So that's a simple, a simple way to understand where we're going today. Have we abdicated? Have we given up not only our right, but our obligation? to ourselves and to future generations to do something, to do democracy, to live democracy, to defend democracy when so much is wrong with it now. And we are looking for somebody or some major event to intervene and solve our problems. We don't have the, we don't have the interest nor the will to say, okay, I am going to jump into the fight here. I'm going to do something. What it is, I don't know yet, but I am not going another day living this way in a country that extols the virtues of freedom and democracy and so forth. And this is what we are experiencing day to day. We have been experiencing it for two years. Now, it is, of course, more than two years. But I'm only starting at the point where Donald J. Trump entered the scene. Daryl from the Bronx, what are your thoughts? You, Trace, it's so good to hear you. Happy New Year. Uh, Thank I, you. You too. And I was in the midst of looking up the the other piece that I had for you. Since you brought up biblical uh, references, try uh, Paul talking in, to the Philippians about uh, the God of Abraham not only providing all his needs, but providing all near, their needs if they believe and have faith. And then you go to Romans, and he says, well, the reason you can't do that is because you didn't renew your mind. Well, if you just take those three things and add Hebrews um, 11.1, which is now faith is the evidence of things hoped for, and the, ooh, did I screw that up? Yes, I did. Is the substance, let me say it again, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not, not seen, seen right? right? So if you just took those three spaces, and since most of these people in this country claim to be Christians, then you have absolutely no excuse for not creating what in the abundance of... I mean, if, if the God of Abraham, if you who you believe in, is the creator of the... Oh, go ahead. Arguing on religious points is a is a non-starter. It's a no-winner because no, 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 of, that's there not, are as many that's interpretations that's not what I'm saying. of religious teaching. So let's get back to the world of our day-to-day reality. I'm not so sure that you could even make a case that our day-to-day reality is informed by religious teaching and understanding. That, that's a whole fresh. other argument. But so let's bring the subject to uh, the question posed. Have we abdicated our responsibility to steer this ship in the right direction? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you could add to that. There's nothing to add to it. You either take there are, there are people out here right now uh, who are, are attempting, or well, they're not attempting, they're pro- that will provide leadership if you are willing to follow. If you don't have the information, they will provide the information. I mean, if people just listen to you and, and Gary, just, just those two people, just listen to those two people and did one-tenth of what you provide in in scientific and, well, in scientific, accepted scientific data, 
wouldn't the world change? Well, you know, we hope so. No, but, no, no. Now, but Steve, does you it, float it off it, on me, and I'm trying to stay stay cool. What what then is required for the world to change? It it's well, our behavior. Suppose you, suppose you answer the question. Okay, take then a, I will take answer a the chance question. and answer the question. We contribute to our own demise. We are what is uh, Pogo uh, Al Cap? We are our greatest enemy. We have fear, and we refuse to move. This outrage of the people being not paid for work. Who's in the street over that? They're not even in the street over that. The man, the same man that you were talking about, called back hundreds of workers to go back to work for no money. Now, in my mind, that's slavery. So why are you working? If what you're working for is to have a better life, get money for your family, blah, 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 why are you doing it for free? especially when it's totally unnecessary, all they have to do is pass the bill in the Senate at the same rate. You need uh, 67 votes. It passed at 100% because it was a voice vote. And if you had 290 votes in, 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 in the House, game over. Ain't got nothing to do with no wall. Ain't got nothing to do with They put the bill on the table. Mitch McConnell said, no, nah, we're not bringing it up. Why isn't every American down in Washington at McConnell's office saying, put it on the floor? Why aren't the people who are there? I heard the union leader at least speak to this. This, If you follow the sham because you don't want to be bothered, then that's what you're going to get. There is no reason for most of the pain that we experience simply because we refuse to take the required action because we think that, it's going to get better by itself, or somebody else is going to do it. So with regard to this man's action at this time, stop talking about him, for one. Leave him out. Start looking at what are the solutions to what are the questions, and then let's work on that. And, and with regard to, the, like I said, the government shutdown has nothing to do with him talking about the wall. It has to do with the Congress not overriding any possible veto he could come up with. You got 290 votes in, 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 the, in the House of Representatives, and the Senate has 67 votes. He's moot. He doesn't care. He doesn't count. Correct? Correct. I would agree with that. So I called And Mr. yet he does. And yet he does. Because well, he, he does because this we same, don't. This same individual is like the 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 break between A D and B C in politics in our experience. Now, that's a myth that they're trying to create. Look back when Reagan did his number. And and, and, and people of European descent still love Reagan and he screwed them royally. He made them go into such debt that when 2008 came along, they lost 90% of their worth. Of course, we lost 100% of our worth, but hey, listen, got to have some difference. Because no matter what happens, the way that the, as long as the population is the way it is and people still want to be white, whether they are of that complexion or not, you're going to have the same problem. So, A, you have to renew your mind. Do you want to be a capitalist, even though you were, you are, not were, you are capital in this system? I don't care whether you're white, black, or whatever. You are just a cog in the wheel. They sell your data, quote, unquote. They make you work for free. And then the little money you do get to take home, they take it away from you. Did you see the... Um, this, there's Out on the Internet, there's a piece about Social Security and how if they had left the money in the trust fund before Reagan borrowed the money to cover the, def the, the tax breaks, that rather than getting $1,400 a month, you'd be getting about $3,000 a month, no matter what goes on. Now, who's talking to that? Well, 
this is a question that we, we have to broach it at some point. If you agree that there has been an abdication, people are just uninvolved, they're not concerned, and yet they are concerned because they understand the implications of being that? unconcerned. If this, what would it take, in your view? What would it take as a stimulus to get people excited about the idea of seeing to their own interests? People will 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 refuse to move beyond their fear. So, a emperor has no clothes. B give them defined answers that they can actually work on without. Too much stress, and so I'll go back to the to the twenty seven day government shutdown that should, that has no reason for being there. Everyone can make a phone call. That's not too threatening. Well, maybe for some people, but for most people who say that they're American citizens, can make a phone call and say, "This is what we're going to do. If you don't open the government today." then we will never vote for you again. That be- begins to give them a little bit of an inkling that people may be upset about this. You well, have to you renew the mind of the pe- You have to remove that fear. People are terrified. 24 hours a day you get hounded. Remember when jobs had benefits? Go- talk to anybody 40 years and younger and talk to them about defined uh, business benefits like sh- insurance and health insurance and things like that. They don't know what you're talking about. Why isn't that no? Oh, this is the one. Now this was this was supposedly a progressive person who said this. Um, why do those why do those government employees get things that get uh, benefits? that uh, the hard-working businessmen don't get blah, 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 blah. I ain't giving the government none of my money to do that. Well, hello, wait a minute. People died to get those benefits. And, and if the company goes bankrupt, you may never see those benefits. So simply because you're living in a structure that is totally insane, that every 20 years or so everybody gets wiped out, I mean, at least, Going back to the biblical reference, you got 50 years before you had to return everything. You're living in a system you don't understand, and you keep spinning your wheels hoping no one's going to look at you and point you out to do anything. You have to remove the fear, and people then need to take the corrective action. And it, the, more of us who are, the more of us who are willing to, to see and work with people and know that those people will then help come help and defend you. When I was more of an activist, we had a battery of lawyers. So when we got arrested, pretty much within two days, we were out in the street again. Momia Abu-Jabal has been in jail for 38 years, and we're just beginning to see daylight. Uh, Imam Al-Amin, nobody even talks about him. H. Rapp has been in federal prison for what? Why? Oh, I'm sounding shrill again. <clears throat> Do you understand what <laughs> okay. I'm saying? But you're getting your point across. I what think I'm you saying have is we have political point. prisoners in this country. If you mention there are political prisoners in this country, people look at you like, what are you talking about? We have people in this country who are starving for no other reason. How can you say a person who has three jobs isn't hardworking, yet they're not making enough money to live in a home that they can your call point? their own. I watched your points the- are well yes. taken, but we have to move well, it along. Um, but thank you so much for getting us started and at this level. Thank you for getting us started at this level. Thanks a lot for your call today, Daryl. We go to South Carolina. Khalil, you're on the air. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I have to agree with some points from the last caller in terms of political prisoners. Uh, That's absolutely the truth. And 
Um, so that's just where I wanted to start because, uh, you know, when, when I feel like the vibe is, is going correctly or whatever, I agree. You know, not that I'm a judge, but, yeah, the, the gentleman was actually correct, you know. I mean, Mumia is not getting, was not getting medical treatment forever. I mean, the only reason he's in there, I mean, you look at that trial. They had him tied up. Judge Sabo was a disgrace. I mean, I grew up, I grew up in there. Then I moved to New York, and then I'm here. But anyway, so I know up, up close and personal. So anyway, um, I think the problem is that people, we've forgotten how to organize. And at the same time, we've forgotten, we've gotten complacent. And at the same time, it's almost illegal to protest now. Look how hard it is to protest. You see? Look look what they did to those young people in Seattle when people first started protesting. The authorities, they, they put on the, the jackboot gear, the armor. You know, it made people not, not care anymore. And, and now people feel like it's too late. I think people have just given up. Um... You know, because if you're thinking, it's, it's, it's so big now. It is so big that we have to start very small. We have to start block by block. And that's why often I talk about a, a co-op. You know, you have to find people on your block. If you live in the city, if you live in the, out in the country, like where I live, you have to. A lot of people don't have cars. You know, live in food deserts. You know, you have to get, you get to know your neighbors. And, and, and we have to start from the ground again. Because we're dealing with global things now. We're dealing with the industrialists and the capitalists. And I will bring you one example. Think about it. When when we go out to eat, if you're fortunate enough to go out to eat, even to just a, a just a rinky dink place, an entree is at least twelve dollars. That's before you have iced tea, before you have a side dish, before you have dessert, and that's one person. Now. We're living in a $10 economy. So what kind of sense does that make? I mean, that's just simple arithmetic. And if you're not good in math, that's not sustainable. That doesn't add up. Am I making any sense here? I'm listening. Yes. So so this should be an alarm to everyone. Like, there will be no middle class. If we keep going like this in another seven years, come on. This is even professionals where I live, they don't, they make $20 an hour, which is nothing. People with, with PhDs make $20 an hour. When, when you, when you prorate it, if you look, you know, this is before benefits. So all I'm saying is that, that we have to remember, we have to relearn what a critical mass is, you know, that, and, and you know, that's just a hackney sociological term but it means something so we you can't people just can't jump up and down here and there and pop up and say oh, i'm protesting and i don't like this it doesn't work like that now for here's a good example there was a wonderful woman from brooklyn this morning that called into a show called washington journal okay on c-span and she was outraged and she claims to be a federal worker and she said you know i believe her too and she said you know all the unions have together, get together and strike for one, at least one day. TSA, every, every union that serves, you know, AFSCME, you know, AFL, CIL, all the unions, but especially the municipal and city unions, just walk off the job for one day, shut the airlines down, because this is, this is nonsense. And, and the media has not been doing a good service to people, because a lot of people are not interested in news, and they just look at, they just hear headlines or whatever, and they've forgotten the fact that the president has owned up to this uh, shutdown. The president had uh, over a billion dollars already, already to spend that he has not spent. And I love the point you brought up a few a few uh, days ago. He can't be trusted with any money. We need to start looking at who is doing title transfers along the border. Who's who's passing along property? Who's buying property? Because he can't be trusted. And, and, and the more days, we're just in a big, a huge mess, a mess. So we have to start from the ground up from our own communities. If, if we're going to survive, you know, honestly, and I'm not being hyperbolic here. I really don't think so because this, this stuff is about to hit the fan. The, the trickle down, like the food trucks, 
you know, when I shoot, when I lived in the city, that was a big thing. You know, everyone wants to get a, a bagel and cream cheese in the morning. You got no federal workers. That that look how many people that's impacting. It, but so I still am not sure that we have pinpointed. I mean, in this scenario that we're experiencing right now, who is to be put on the hot seat here in terms of leadership and pointing away? Because one of the problems I know you would agree is that even those people who do want to do something are not sure what to do. They're not sure, they're not given guidance as to what would be an effective use of their energy and time. So what do you say to a situation like this where we're all angry, we're very angry about what is happening, uh, but we still don't seem to have uh, people telling us in what ways our actions would be helpful to solving the situation. Well, I would direct it back to the union leaders to begin with, because amen, uh, amen. Well, I'm serious because when I was in the, I was I, I was a proud union member for ten years of AFSCME, and they wouldn't tell you how to vote, but the union rep or your shop store would come and say, you know, this is the, these are the candidates and these are their stands and these are their records. And, you know, and these are the judges. And as you stated before, a lot of times it's difficult. It takes a lot, especially, oh, it takes a lot of time to do information searches on judges and what their record is. But that's the place to start. And on the other hand, uh, I think that we need to focus on the House of Representatives and call our representatives because Mitch McConnell is falling down on the job. We don't have to wait around. He's the one who's holding up a vote. See, we can over and but see what he's scared of. He can override the vote. The House and the Senate will get together to open the government up because that's affecting them too. But it's Mitch McConnell who will not bring it to the floor. He knows the rules. But you see, we had to put pressure on on that organism because he he is he has out, outlived his uh, value now, as far as um, since you know normal people are concerned, he, he's he's just out of control. This the people do not want this government shut down. So that's a that's a two prong approach, um, because this cannot this cannot go on. Come on, our food is not being inspected, and now you hear people say, "Well, it's not affecting me." Yes, it is affecting you. You just don't see it. So, so I'm I'm just glad you're bringing this up. This is uh, it's a leadership issue, just like you said. Now, now we are when we've known this man that you know we had no leadership. We have no leadership right now. We're rudderless. Matter of fact, we are vulnerable. Let's hope nothing, no one attacks us uh, physically. They're already attacking us in different ways. But my goodness, we can do better. We can do better than this. But you know, once again, uh, co-ops and 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 study the what the party for self defense did because that that was a pattern. That that's a recipe that works. So we need a recipe from the unions, and and people have to um, call the representative and. and and tell Mitch McConnell he needs to do his job. He, he needs to, to do more than his job. We need to do our job and make sure that he understands that we are going to compel him to do his job. There, there's a, a, a malaise that we've been living in for years now. I would say uh, since Barack Obama left office, uh, we, we've sunk back into this idea that we're safe. Somehow that uh, those eight years of his his being in office uh, made things smooth for us, you know, and we don't have to worry. But if people really understood the enormity of what this shutdown means and what, what it is doing, Right. I I just don't see how we could stand idly by. And, you know, well, like we're observing a championship fight. But we, we're really not in the fight. We're just observing it. Thanks, Khalil, for your comments today. 
888-874-4888. Let's take this short break and come back to your thoughts right after this. Listening to Lead Stories on PRN.FM. I'm Utrice Lead, and we are continuing our conversation about where we are and why we are where we are. The 27 day uh, days of of, uh, of a government instituted, I should say. Donald Trump instituted uh, shutdown, which has become kind of academic. People are talking about this in academic terms, and yet it raises so many questions about where we are, where we the people are. How did we allow this to happen? How is it that we are allowing it to continue to happen. Have we totally abdicated from this idea that we are, as citizens of the country, we are also guardians of this concept that we hear so much about called democracy. We also steer the ship of state. We also determine how this country is to be run. We also are the guardians of of democracy and justice. And we seem to be outside of this equation, just observing from day to day, you know, what is the change in the dynamic uh, among the main parties. And we're not at the table. We're not part of the the uh, the equation we're not having much say we're not having much effect and yet in this the specific instance here as i keep reminding people we have 800,000 workers who basically are victims of a stick up not only that they are compelled to work for free. They are strongly, quote, discouraged from looking for employment elsewhere. I have to remind you that 800,000 people is more people than many small countries. And yet, the United States remains calm and governable, and people are talking about, you know, well, we just have to talk it over. We just need the people to come to the table who are the ones who are going to end this, if it is to be ended. And that still, of course, does not include us. But we have to insist. We are not demanding of ourselves that we rise to the occasion and to the expectation of our own leadership. We have just, you know, moved out of the the circle of power ourselves. And we are saying, well, you know, it can't go on forever. This is the reasoning. It can't go on forever. And somehow or the other, it will all be solved. That's not the point. The point is that we share 
a responsibility for the direction of this nation. And the expectation is if we, if we say something, that ought to be respected. We have said as, as the people, we do not. We do not support this shutdown. And we want the workers restored immediately. But we see we have no backup either. The leadership of the unions just has been abysmal. And the, the response, although people individually have opinions, we don't see that translating into mass movement. David from Brooklyn, you're on the air. Good afternoon, you trace. Uh, I've been listening to uh, all the things you're saying about our responsibilities in terms of this, that, and the other. And what comes to mind to me is clear in my mind is that the uh, oligarchy, the ruling class that rarely runs the country, has done a masterful, masterful job of training people the way they want them to be, to be like it's right now. Uh, this is like uh, a master dog trainer who has trained all the dogs to do exactly what he wants done. They're not uh, training the dog to uh, do what's good for uh, everybody else. In this case, the masses of people are not uh, rebelling. There, there are uh, no big rebellions anywhere. So essentially, what I see is the oligarchy that owns and runs the country has got the people so well trained that they're not even going to rebel. This is in Switzerland where they have some democracy. This is in France, where people rebel if you do something like this. This is in the Scandinavian countries, <laughs> where they have some kind of democratic uh, capitalism to some degree. This is the United States, where you have the chief means of control of people, is the regular divide and conquer based on white supremacy racism. So it's no surprise to me that you can do things to people like, uh, you know, have people work as slaves <laughs> and, and uh, get away with it and no rebellion. Uh, you can have the masses of people um, sit back and uh, just suffer and no mass rebellions, no strikes, anything to any large extent. And that's what's happening. The ruling class, the oligarchy that owns and runs the country, they own the country, have got the rest of the people so well trained in their schools and, and with their media and all the things they do uh, to, to people to get them in check. So uh, the people like, you know, train animals, and the ruling class is the master of that training method, and they've been at it for some time, and they've, as I say, reached the Everest, Everest of uh, how to train people to do what they want, which is nothing. There are no pressure on those uh, little creeps that work in the Congress, and they control that, and they control everything else. So it's no surprise that there's no rebellion and forget about the idea of democracy. It does not exist here. This is an oligarchy, not a democracy. So that's the way I look at it. And, uh, you know, I, I may uh, uh, feel that um, this is unfortunate, <laughs> but that's the way I see it. But even so, even though, and I, I agree with you, on the point that there is an organized system of control. Has it been so complete, so successful, 
that there isn't a glimmer yet of independent thought and action on the part of the people who are suffering and the people who are leading them. Well, you know, there, there may be a little uprising here and there, but the training, the, the training that has been given to the people by the ruling class is so effective that it can get away with doing this nonsense uh, that's going on now with Trump and his stupid wall and, and even having people think that that's all the money it is of $5.7 billion. That's just a drop in the bucket. It'd probably be a lot more to put up some dumb wall like that. But the point is that people are going for the okie doke. You have all these ways of dividing people and they uh, will even uh, start speaking those people who are victimized with this, as I have noticed in some of the media, have, have, have gone along with Trump. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, it just shows you how well you can train people just like you train dogs and uh, monkeys and things like that. And uh, the ruling class, uh, they, they are brilliant at that. And that's what they're doing now. And they have done that so well that they don't have any mass rebellion as of yet. Uh, I don't think they'll let it go to the point where people start rebel. They may back up somewhat, but uh, they, they're they just brilliant in how they can manipulate the mass of people that live in this country. I mean, it's it's a very sad, sad thing. Thank you. Thank you for your considered opinion today. Vincent from New York, you're on the air. Good afternoon. I'm sorry afternoon. to say I didn't hear most of the program, but in regards to um, this shutdown of the so-called government, I think it should continue. The reason being is so, can, so it can expose the true people who are behind this and how few they are in number in comparison to the masses of people who are going to break, wake up and realize it's up to them to change their condition on their own and do for self. And when I say that, I mean that they must exercise their humanity and stop expecting others to do for them as civilians. If they show the humanity in them as a person that should reflect upon others to do the same. This won't be no easy, nicey, nice type of thing, but it will come to a point whereas basic needs will need to be met and shared with others in a common understanding. And don't rely on capitalism to be the solution for your problem. Because this nation wasn't founded on capitalism per se, it was founded on brutality mistreatment, theft, and the concept of people who were not indigenous to this land to establish a society of their own on a land that was already occupied by a civilized people. So when people in this nation start to understand that within the United States of America and the land of North America, which implements its foreign policies abroad to destabilize other land masses and nations. And those people look to come to the United States of America to fulfill a dream, which is nothing more than a propaganda to leave what you have to come to a nation that was built on a lie. Then it shows how you've been misled from the outside in in the inside out. So but, this is a uh, if world you don't issue. mind my asking you. Yes. I get your point, but at the same time, do you not recognize that what you're saying is that the very people who are suffering for no reason, they are suffering for no reason, must continue to suffer for no reason. No, I'm not saying that the people who are suffering, such as myself, are not suffering for no reason. The reason why we're suffering is because we're being misled 
about our suffering. And the further that we suffer, we will start to realize that our suffering is a common interest among some others. And the solution relies within ourselves to shed our fear of the system that has us misled and in control. Because you can live in fear or you can live without fear, but you won't know until you try something different on your own. All right. So could you further elucidate your point by looking at where things stand today with this shutdown? Uh, Just yesterday, local news here in South Florida uh, ran a story. And the story was about a just a small businessman. He happens to have a a restaurant. It's not expensive or anything, but an airport. He has a restaurant at the airport, which is um, an adjunct to his full fledged restaurant. It's called Chef Creole. I happen to know him. He has been feeding at no cost the workers at the airport every day who do not have the wherewithal to buy their own food. Now, apart from the fact that it is an extraordinary gesture of generosity and concern and humanitarian concern, he is absorbing, as a small businessman, he is absorbing an inordinate expense. And it's not as if people recognizing that this is what he says he could do. He's a small uh, business owner. It's a Haitian restaurant. Nobody has yet stepped forward and said, okay, now that you're doing that, I could uh, put $10 or $20 in the pot to defray the cost. It costs money to do something like that. And I'm thinking, people were saying what a wonderful act it is and he is that kind of guy he's his business is known in the haitian community and even outside of it uh he does a lot of community-minded things but he did say that he served more than 350 meals how would why would people not understand that that is something they need to support That could be because the people that he is speaking to and trying to get his message across to are the wrong people. It could probably be seen to the people that he is serving that there's a misunderstanding in what they have gone through leading up to coming to this man to be fed for free or for a nominal fee, that they can't see beyond what he is doing for them, for them. And what others who are not even getting fed in comparison, you must also look at it this way. There are people still surviving for years in this country without employment on the books, as I would say. And those people might not have had the education or occupational background as as those who are being um, relieved of their duties in these various jobs today who just wanted to come in and get employment and learn on the job. Teach me as I worked. But they raised the criteria for so many different jobs, having a high school diploma, some years of college education, some uh, credits, some degree here, another degree there, raising the bar from minor tasks that some people will say, I've given up and I've gone into business by myself. And they started jobs or businesses off the books in the communities, but they were criminalized for doing it, not selling drugs, not importing drugs. They were doing other things that such businesses today are doing now on the books, but they were criminalized for their creativity because they weren't let into the system. But they are still surviving today. To where you started, because we're running out of time. 
Okay. What what do you uh, see as a a major problem here? We we have, as I said, eight hundred thousand workers affected uh-huh. their families and and so forth. What is it that you think we ought to do as lay people? What should we be doing? Okay, this might seem like I'm going in a different direction, but if we lose focus in this country of the brutality of black men by law enforcement in this country who might be homeless, who might be employed at low wages, who might not have their relationship with their child's mother anymore or their parents. But, but who Vincent, are, I want you to, to deal with the question at hand because that's what it, I'm it's saying. That, that's what I'm trying question. to tell you. This is connected. But, it, Bec- it, but you, you're kind of a little bit off center here in terms of your focus. What I want you to do is to... Oh, here's the music. Well, we're out of okay. time. So, thank you so much for your participation today. Thank you all for calling in. Tomorrow, it's, of course, Free Your Mind Friday, and we'll see each other then. Continue talking to each other. Bye-bye.